This video is sponsored by MSI. The choice between air and liquid cooling might be a difficult one, but it doesn't have to be. So here's everything you need to know about air and liquid cooling. Both cooling methods are vastly different from each other, but they both achieve the same goal, which is cooling your processor. For water coolers, which in our case today is the MSI Mag Core Liquid A13 360ml all-in-one liquid cooler, they typically have a pump in the CPU block. This then circulates the hot water into the radiator, which is then dissipated by the fans outside of your case. And if you've ever wondered what the millimeter size of all-in-one liquid coolers actually corresponds to, it's the size of the radiator. So a 120mm only has one 120mm fan on it, and a 360mm is basically another two of these added onto it, so it's got three 120 millimeter fans. And the higher this number, the higher the cooling capacity of the cooler. And a lot of people believe that all-in-one liquid coolers look a lot more refined and a lot cleaner in a PC build, which is something I can get behind, but this is down to personal preference. It's not a performant argument if that makes sense. And then there's air coolers like Noctua's NHU-12A. These are a more simplistic approach to cooling the processor as there's much fewer parts involved. You've got a cold plate which is hooked up to some heat pipes which carries the heat away from the processor into the aluminium heat sink. Then there's one or two fans, in this case there's two, pushing the heat away from the aluminium heat sink, therefore cooling your processor. And this is why a lot of people call air coolers cool cool there's, there's a lot of that word in today's video anyways this is why they're called the old reliable as they're much more simplistic and this means there's only one point of failure which is the fan bearing itself and if that happens you could just always put on a new fan this is why air coolers are so reliable liquid coolers from my experience are a bit harder to install purely because there's a few more steps involved Firstly, I always like to install the radiator, which requires quite a bit of screws, especially with a 360 millimeter rad. But it's nothing that's too hard. You just need a bit of multitasking skills. And then to save the dangling CPU block, we can mount the CPU bracket on the back of the motherboard. And in the case of this, it's got some sticky tape on it as well, so it stays there, which is nice to see. Apply some thermal paste, which you can't miss and then apply the cooler. MSI out of the box have included an LGA 1851 and 1700 mounting bracket, so it works natively with our 13700K system. But there is also an AM4 and AM5 mounting bracket as well. Luckily, MSI pre-installed the fan, so that's one step already removed, and they've also got a Y splitter for the RGB, so you can run it off a single header on your motherboard, which is just one of those things I love to see. It's just really making the user experience quite a bit easier, which is always a huge win. But air coolers, in my opinion, are much easier to install as there's just fewer steps for the most part. On Intel systems, you'll need a backplate. AMD users have it lucky as they've got that built into the motherboard already. Anyways, building one out isn't really that hard on Intel systems. Then we'll need the standoffs and the screws, put on the brackets, apply the thermal paste, mount the heatsink, on top of the processor. And once it's mounted, it's time for the fans which just clip on in the case of the Noctua coolers. And we need a Y splitter as there's two fans with this cooler and then plug it into the CPU fan header and there's your air cooler installed. Much more simple in my opinion. Oh, also by the way, some air coolers also have RGB so you'll need to plug that in as well if that's the case for you. I doubt you're going to be buying your next CPU cooler based off of the user experience. You're going to be a bit more interested in performance. And for the most part, 360mm coolers and even 420 mils often handily outperform their air counterparts. And to find out, I've done some quick and dirty tests just to see how both of these coolers are stacking up against each other. And at idle, the A13 360mm wins out by about 4 degrees but we're looking at like 29 degrees C compared to 33. Not really that much of a big difference. You're not really going to notice this at all. And then taking a look at single threaded workloads, which imitates stuff like gaming and, but mainly just gaming. We see identical performance across both of these coolers, which is good to see because whether you want to go with air or liquid, you'd get relatively similar performance 
for the most part, it depends on what cooler you end up deciding to go with. I know that NHU-12A didn't perform as well as the Cool Liquid A13, but this can be attributed to its smaller size and if we used a much beefier air cooler like the NH D15 G2 which is one of the best air coolers on the market I reckon these numbers would have been a lot more closer and I don't think the 13700K would have thermal throttled but the temperature results depend on a multitude of factors like your case's airflow, your ambient temperature and even the specific cooler that you're using so this is something that you should keep in mind if your heart's set on liquid cooling already, the MSI Mag Core Liquid A13 360ml could be the perfect option for you. It's especially great for Intel users as it's got a pre-applied LGA 1851 and 1700 mounting bracket and it's also got the cooling capacity to cool these furnace processors. And AM4 and 5 are also supported. It's got a totally new radiator designed with 12 widened channels, increasing water flow by 25% while retaining 20 fins per inch. So cooling capacity has been greatly improved compared to the previous generation. And with its 360 millimeter radiator size, it's guaranteed to cool chips like the i7-13700K, which we're using today, and even some of the highest end Ryzen 9s without breaking a sweat. And it's not all performance without looks, as there's plenty of addressable RGB on this cooler, including the CPU block and the fans as well, which can be ran off a Y splitter. So if you only wanted to use one header on your motherboard and sync all the cooler up, that's a possibility. And the cover on the CPU block can be rotated and you can even apply custom third party ones. So if you wanted to spice it up even further, that's a possibility too. And MSI mounted the fans right out of the box, meaning that's one less step for you to worry about. So if you wanted to pick up the MSI Mag Core Liquid A13 360mm cooler, I've got it linked in the description below. The second most important factor in my opinion is acoustics. It's okay having a very nice cooler that cools your CPU very well, but if it's extremely loud, it's just not going to cut it, especially for me. So this is something I think you should keep in mind. The general rule of thumb is liquid cooling can be slightly louder depending on a few factors because you've got multiple fans which can all ramp up and be quite loud, especially if your fan curve is not set properly and you also can get pump noise, but this only occurs at very high RPMs where the law of diminishing returns will set in anyways, so that's not recommended. But I can say both of these callers are absolutely excellent acoustically at idle, and if you were wearing headphones or even not wearing headphones with the side panel on, you probably wouldn't hear either of them. Under full load, Air cooling performs exceptionally well. And this is down to Noctua's brilliance. Their fans are just absolutely top on the market, especially in terms of their acoustic performance, which is why we've got a ton of them here on the channel. Anyways, this could be bypassed by putting Noctua fans on the radiator. And I think it would be much closer in terms of the acoustic performance. But one thing that's always going to be in liquid cooling is the pump sound, which to be honest, isn't really bad with the A13 360 millimeter. So yeah, I don't think you're going to be having any problems, but regardless, if you're gaming with a headset on or making work and that sort of stuff, you won't be having any issues with either of these coolers. Both air and liquid coolers have some inherent traits which could be good or bad depending on how you look at things. With water coolers, I found that it's much easier to take out your graphics card. So this is why I've got one in my testing system as we're just always changing graphics cards here. And the reason as to why is pretty simple. There's no massive chunk of aluminium above your graphics card. So you can get your finger in there and release the PCIe latch pretty easily. And this also ties into the sleeker looking design. A lot of people think that all-in-one liquid coolers look quite a bit sleeker than their air counterparts, which, like I said, is something I can definitely get behind, as it's like kind of cool as you've got like pipes and radiators and fans and a CPU block. It does look quite sleek. And liquid coolers also take longer to heat soak. Water has more thermal mass, I'd like to say is the term for it. Anyways, this takes it longer to heat up, but conversely, it also takes longer to cool down after you've stopped gaming or 
putting a load on your processor. And for the most part, closed all-in-one liquid coolers are not serviceable. So if the pump goes, which is the biggest point of failure in these coolers, you're basically at the mercy of either warranty or you've got to replace the unit entirely. This isn't a problem with custom loops, but that's not something we're going over today. But let's end off on a good one. If you move around with your PC a lot, all-in-one liquid coolers are secured to the PC via multiple points instead of just the CPU socket. So they're a lot sturdier in transit and you don't need to worry about a massive chunk of aluminium potentially flying around in your case if you've secured your radiator properly. But air has some inherent traits which just simply aren't present on liquid coolers. One of them is of how reliable they are. Because there's less moving parts with air coolers, they tend to last quite a bit longer and the only problem that I could think of with them is just the fan bearings going, which is also a problem on liquid coolers too. And if a fan bearing goes, you, all you need to do is just replace the fan and that's it. And air is often quite a bit more affordable, mainly because of they don't require as much engineering and R&D, I'd like to say, because if you think about it, all you've got is a cold plate, a few heat pipes, an aluminium heatsink, and a couple of fans at most. Yes, engineering definitely does go into them, but brands don't need to make sure it's sealed and it doesn't leak all over the PC as we're just using heat pipes and aluminium here. Another inherent trait of air coolers is they cool down much quicker than water. This is because water holds onto heat for much longer than what aluminium does, which can be a good or a bad thing. To be honest, it doesn't really matter. But what you'll see is after a gaming session or thrashing your processor, temperatures will come down much quicker with an air cooler compared to a water. To be honest, it, it doesn't really make a difference. It's just more of an observation, if anything. And then aesthetically, some people may prefer the looks of air coolers, as especially they do fill out the space above your graphics card pretty well. If you think about it, it's a tower or two of aluminium. So, you know, as, as we can see here, it does quite a good job of filling out a PC. But then again, a radiator can also do that job too. So, Hopefully now it should be easy for you to make a decision whether to go with air or liquid cooling for your next gaming PC build. But if you wanted a liquid cooler, I think the MSI Mag Core Liquid A13 360mm is absolutely brilliant, especially for furnace CPUs like the 13700K. It's done a really good job in our testing today and I highly recommend it. And it'll be linked in the description below with my affiliate link, so if you want to pick it up, you can do. Anyways, if you want to see how a high-end 4040p graphics card gets on, you can watch in a video up there. With that being said, I'll catch you in the next one.